let's begin our worship together in song. So let's stand together and sing. I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning. Uh, there's, let's begin our worship. Well, continue our worship. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that once again we can gather together in your house to worship you, especially during this holiday season. Help us to be mindful of what the true meaning of the season is. We ask, dear Lord, that you accept our worship this day and we lift up those that have a special need, that need a touch from you today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'd like to highlight a few of the announcements this morning. Uh, the book club will be meeting tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, there will be Sunday school after church, but before Sunday school, after church, we're going to have a little uh, farewell fellowship for Lane and Julia. This is their last Sunday with us. Is, uh, they're heading to Basseteer, is that how you say that? St. Kitts, uh, to attend veterinary school. So we want to give them a wonderful, loving send-off this morning. Um, and also this evening, there will be, oh, I already said that. The book club will be meeting tonight. And next Sunday on Christmas Day, there will not be, there will be worship, but no Sunday school. Um, I also have a, a card acknowledgement from Kathy Barber. She thanks everyone for their prayers. Um, so thank you for that. And at this time, Shyla is going to come up. Um, I don't know, I, I guess I'm the lucky or fortunate one that gets to uh, present uh, Pastor and Cindy with a Christmas gift, but um, our congregation just appreciates you so much. And so um, this is from the whole congregation, and we just want to thank you and bless you this Christmas. And uh, uh, we're just uh, very um, grateful for all you do for us all year long. So Merry Amen. Christmas from the congregation. Okay. And I also just want to say to the congregation, um, you are such a loving and giving and generous congregation. Our, uh, Rachel's not here today, but our Christmas gift was beautiful. You all just did a great job and also your donation for pastor. So I just really appreciate um, each one of you. So thank you.
I do also want to mention, sorry, you give the preacher a mic. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> but uh, on, on the Christmas family, uh, due to your generosity, we were able to bless the, the target family that we had and help them uh, extensively. And then we were also able to adopt a second family as well who's going through a very tough time. And we were able to help them as well. So again, thank you for your generosity. And just Merry Christmas to all of you and just pray that for God's peace and, and healing for whatever may be going on in your lives and, and just feel his presence and his love. Thank you. Thank you. And at this time, I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward to receive our eyes and our offerings. <laughs> Our scripture reading this morning is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18, 20 to 22, or chapter 2, verse 2. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem and asked... Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And let's continue our worship. At Stand as you're able and let's sing some more carols. Thank you. 
for prayer. Um, Elaine and Julie, I'm not sure if your parents warned you, but they asked if we could call you up and have laying on of hands uh, to kind of commission you as you're heading out. So if you would come forward at this time. And whoever would like to come and participate in that, this is Lane and Julia's last Sunday with us for a time. So if you would like to come and join in that prayer, we invite you to come on up. And then we will, we'll just have our kind of regular prayer. Um, and then at the end, we'll have the prayer for... Uh, Lane and Julia. Lord, we do thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the way that you love us each and every day. We thank you for the blessings that you surround us with. And at Christmas especially, we think of the, the gift of yourself to us, how you came to earth and, and taught us how to live and taught us how to love. And Lord, we praise you for that. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to surrender our lives back to you as our way of saying thank you for what you have done. And Lord, we do lift up those who are hurting today. We have several in our church with different physical challenges right now. And Lord, we do lift Deb Lockwood up to you, especially as she fell during the night and now has a broken leg. Lord, we just pray that you will be with her. Um, we pray that you will bring healing to her. And Lord, we also lift up Elaine Clark as she's received a diagnosis of cancer and really no more details, but Lord, we just pray that you will touch her and that you will strengthen her. And Lord, we pray that you will bring healing to her. And Lord, we do thank you that for the families that you have put us in. And Lord, we do thank you for our church family. And Lord, we thank you for Lane and Julia today and as they're going to be heading out and starting this new phase in their lives. Lord, we just pray that you will be with them. We pray that you will bless them that you will fill them with your peace. Lord, we pray for your protection, for your guidance. We pray that you will open the right doors before them. Lord, we pray that they will serve you well and that they can be a positive witness to all around of what you can do in their lives. We ask this in your name. Amen. And if you want to stand as you're able, we have one more song. <laughs>
the past two, three years, on the second Sunday of every month, my brother would um, offer special music at the First Baptist Church of Detroit. Um, he was very gifted, and I'm blessed to call him my brother. Um, I would like to share with you this morning the song that he played on November 13th, which was last month, which was the last song that he shared at First Baptist. So I want to share that with you all now. three weeks after this, yep. that he sang this, um, her brother passed away suddenly. And they actually planned to play this, uh, this special during his own service. Um, then there was a power outage, and that wasn't possible from what I understand, but they thought her brother would have actually thought that was kind of funny. Um, but it, to me, it's a challenge, too. Very unexpected death. But he was ready and actually helped write his own service. You know, what kind of lives are we living? Are, 
Are we giving lives of service to God? There's the saying, carpe diem, you know, carpe diem, seize the day, make the most of the day. We like that, right? Attack the day. It's our day. Make the most of it. It makes a great bumper sticker, carpe diem. But what if in tra- instead we tried dedatio diem? Anybody familiar with that one? Surrender the day. I wasn't familiar with it either. Had to look it up this morning. Dedatio diem. It doesn't have the same ring as seize the day, does it? But when we get down to it, it may be far more effective. In Acts chapter 6, the church was facing a, a crisis. As we've talked about before, the, the church was pooling many of their resources together to help the, the members that were struggling. And then they would share these resources. But human nature being what it is, some of the locals that were administering the funds were giving more to their friends than they were to other people in the group. And so it wasn't an equal distribution. And some of the folks got upset about that. And they went to the apostles and said, you have to come in and take care of this. We want you to run the program so everybody gets it equal. And the apostles came back to them and said, it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. So brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and of wisdom. And we'll return this responsibility over to them. And they chose Stephen and six others. So the word of God spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And I like that even through this challenge, this crisis, the church grew. I mean, normally we don't think crises are much fun. uh, Because, let's face it, in the middle of a crisis, or a crisis, it's not much fun usually. It's a struggle. But God can use even those times to help us. Several years ago, I was talking with a friend and um, a ministry that I was in charge of, we'd lost one of our key personnel in it. And I'm going, oh, now what are we going to do? How are we going to make it through this? It's like, oh, no, it's, I mean, the ministry going to survive and everything? And my friend gave some good advice when he said that he had learned to start to consider every personnel change as an opportunity to improve the organization. He said, you might not want to have lost the person, you know, um, you might still want them back, but if they have to go, then this is a chance to either improve the program or possibly the person, or both. And you can make it better. And that's what they did here. In this situation, they were able to develop or to discover new leaders. And they brought them in, and apparently these people were gifted at running the the ministries, the the food bank that they were basically running. And I'm guessing that was probably not in the the gift set of the apostles. You know, we don't know that much about the personalities of the apostles, but I have trouble picturing Peter sitting at a desk and, and just being happy about keeping track of how many boxes of macaroni and cheese they had on hand. You know, I, I, I just have trouble figuring that. Now, Matthew, he was a tax collector. That might have been right up his alley, but that's not what God called him to do. So they found people that had that gifting of administration, the people that had the compassion to serve others. And they asked them to lead this ministry, and it grew when the right people with the right gifting were willing to do their part and were willing to serve, then the church grew. When we come together and we're each willing to do our part, good things can happen. But are we willing to serve? Are we willing to do our part? In Romans 12, verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes, I know he does. I urge you, I should just look up there. I urge you, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. See, being a follower of Jesus Christ is not supposed to be a spectator sport. We don't just come to church for a Sunday and sit here for an hour or watch it on TV or something like that and say, we're done. You know, we've watched our part. 
Serving God is supposed to be just that, service. Our lives are supposed to be a living sacrifice where we surrender ourselves each day to God's will for us. And we allow him to work through us. And Paul says that as we surrender to him, as we do his work, those works that we do actually become our acts of worship. I mean, when we come together, this is worship. When we read our Bibles, that's worship. When we pray, that is worship. But also when we serve each other, that is worship. When you give to help someone who is struggling, that's an act of worship. When you do something as simple as holding the door for somebody whose hands are full, that can be an act of worship. When we do it in in God's name, when we do it because of the love that he's placed in us, that is an act of worship. And we need to be giving of ourselves that way. But none of us can do everything that God wants us to do or, or everything that God needs to have done. And that's why many times throughout the scripture, God uses the image of the church as the body of Christ, where we all have different abilities. And going on in Romans 12, Paul writes, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members don't all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body. We have different gifts according to the grace that he has given us. So he gives each of us different abilities, and when we bring them together, good things happen. But we have to use them. Paul goes on from there to give some some advice, which is kind of amazing and should be completely redundant. Because he goes on and he says, if you have the gift of prophecy, prophesy. If you have the gift of teaching, teach. If you have the gift of encouraging, encourage. If you have the gift of helping, help. You notice a bit of a pattern here. You know, he's saying, if you got it, use it. When we are each willing to do our part, great things can happen. And Paul shouldn't have to tell us that. I mean, that should be self-evident, shouldn't it? But it's not. Because far too often, we're willing to kind of sit back and wait for someone else to step up and do the work that God has told us to do. And the work that God has designed for us. And sometimes the work that God has designed us to do. Because God designs each of us, each of us differently. I know we're Americans, we firmly believe that all people are created equal. And yes, that's true, but while we all have equal value, we do not have equal talents. We do not have equal abilities. People aren't interchangeable. I mean, that's obvious in the animal kingdom. We put it, we use, if we use animals, that won't get me into as much trouble. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to start with a profound statement. I wrote this out as, as I was writing the sermon. I wrote this out and thought, that is a stupid statement. But it starts out, all dogs are dogs. I'm assuming no one will disagree with that. All dogs are dogs, but not all dogs are created equal. Not all dogs have the same ability. If you are going to be using a sled dog to save your life as you're mushing across the wilderness of, uh, of Alaska, I am assuming you would not want to get a chihuahua as your lead dog, you know? And if anybody else gets lost with the picture of that little dog in the, in the harness, I, that got me for a while too. You know, that just wouldn't work. Or if you want a lap dog to give you comfort in your tiny little apartment in New York, then you probably wouldn't pick a Great Dane. You know, it just doesn't fit. Each one is a dog, each one has unique abilities, but they're not interchangeable. And it works the same way with people, it really does. Paul says that God gives some the ability to teach. Some, not so much. And we can learn from the teachers. On Wednesday this week for Kids Jam, Naomi and Bonnie came in to help with crafts. 
And Bonnie started um, walking the kids through the, the craft and giving the instructions step by step. And Bonnie is a, uh, a talented teacher. And she was working with the class that I normally work with. And it was fun watching her dealing with some of the behavioral issues that I deal with every week and learning better ways to do it. You know? Because that's her gifting. God designed each of us in a specific way so that we can together do the work that he needs done. But it doesn't really matter what our gifting is if we don't use it. Now, I've been reading a a sci-fi adventure series that Cody got me hooked on. And in it, uh, the the hero, he has a lot of special abilities, sci-fi, fantasy, adventure type stuff. One of the things, he can cure people of diseases. And on the planet that he's on, a lot of people can do that. So he's not unique. A lot of people can do it. But he kept finding, especially in the poor villages, that the healers wouldn't come out. Because, let's face it, there weren't that many people, and they were poor, they can't pay, that sort of thing. And so when he would go around to these villages, he would heal a bunch of people. And at one of the times when he's doing that, a group of people have gathered around and they're watching and they're impressed that he's doing it and they're saying, isn't this great? And one of the big wigs from the big town came and said, what's the big deal? My sister can do the same thing. But I love the question that a guy came up with. He said, well, she can, but does she? You know, it doesn't really matter what our gifts are. If we don't use them, they don't do any good. We each have different gifts that God has given us. And when we use them together, we can do the work God wants us to accomplish. And part of using those gifts is surrendering them to God. Because let's face it, most of us have some, uh, you know, some ideas of what we would like to do. You know, this this is my plan. But are we willing to surrender those plans to God? Stephen was working at the food bank. I wonder if some people, including Stephen, ever thought that he was overqualified for that ministry. Because when we read on just a little bit farther in chapter 6, it says that Stephen was a man full of God's grace and power who did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. They had a miracle worker running a food pantry. Doesn't that seem like overkill? You know, I mean, doesn't that seem a little bit like having Tom Brady coaching Pop Warner football? But I do believe Stephen was right where God wanted him to be. Because the context that he made there set him up for his eventual confrontation and witness to the Sanhedrin. And when... We know the story. Stephen ended up being put on trial. And he gave his defense, and they said no, and they executed him. He became the first martyr. The living sacrifice became a sacrifice. And a lot of us would look at that and go, oh, man, that was a fail. But for 2,000 years, Stephen's defense has helped point people toward Jesus. You know, I'm thinking he was right where God wanted him to be. And when he was willing to surrender his life to God, God was able to use him to have a profound impact even on people two millennia later. Paul says that we're to be living sacrifices. A sacrifice is basically a surrender where we give ourselves to God each day. But do we have the courage to really do that? Would we dare each day to say, Lord, I surrender this day to you? You know, and and usually if you're going to do something like that, they'll tell you the first thing in the morning before your feet even hit the floor, before you get out of bed, before your head comes off the pillow. There's lots of phrases they use for that. 
make that statement. I, I would encourage you to wait, because for a lot of us, um, we don't wake up very gracefully, and really those first few moments, we have no idea what we've just said. Um, but when, maybe when you get to breakfast, when you get out of the shower, whatever it is, that first sip of coffee, that first bite of cereal, then would we dare to say, Lord, I surrender this day to you. What do you want me to do? We like the idea of carpe diem, seize the day. But what ju- imagine what God could do if we would dedicate diem. Let's stand for prayer. Dear Lord, I do thank you for the way that you work in our lives. Lord, I thank you for what you have done for us. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to joyfully, willfully, willingly serve you. Lord, may we be effective ministers for you as we surrender our lives, our days to you so that we can do the work that you have for us. We ask this in your name. Amen.